This is the Grey Space Podcast. Welcome to the Grey Space Podcast. My name is Luke, and in this episode, Matthew Lewis and I are discussing the film Annihilation with Natalie Portman. Now, hopefully, you've seen the movie. That will certainly help you make sense of and probably help you enjoy the the discussion and sort of think along with us. But if you haven't, it's okay. There is a, a summary at the beginning. We try our best to summarize the films that we watch in each in each discussion. There are certainly some Jungian ideas as well as themes and symbols related to Eastern traditions and religions. We get into all that stuff and quite a bit more as well. So. I hope you enjoy the discussion. If you have your own ideas or your own analysis as you're going through it and you're watching on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. And while you're there, why not hit the like button and also subscribe? Why not? If you're not on YouTube and you're listening elsewhere, then then just just think your comments in your own head. All right, let's get into the discussion. Maybe we could start off by you just saying, wow, Luke, that was a really great intro. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, that was, man, that was the best intro. Thank you. You've done so far. So, yeah. Thanks. That, is, that was fantastic. I appreciate it. That means a lot to me. So, um, at, I want to just sort of say at the start, as we as we do sometimes in our conversations, the, the back the background for why we decided to do this and then we'll do a summary then we'll get into the um the conversation so actually you suggested this one i think you suggest pretty much every film we discuss except for which one was mine which one did i say her her yeah that was mine yeah otherwise every everyone has been your idea (laughs) so why why this film uh i think i remember the first time i watched it uh, I think maybe I had just finished Oriental Mythology by Joseph Campbell. Uh-huh. And so kind of getting that crash course and it seemed to be pretty specific to Eastern ideas. So, Well, it, it doesn't seem specific to Eastern ideas, but it does seem to have some, some uh, ties to Eastern philosophy and Eastern thought. Uh, it's hard to say because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of Jungian stuff in the movie, and you could say that's specifically Jungian, but the mandala stuff, for example, is also Eastern, and, and Jung was really interested in in that. So we can, yeah. I think we can get into that stuff. But um, well, I think there is a there's one specific image that oh wow that looks like somebody in a yoga pose, and we'll talk about it. And so then to me that was kind of a cue of okay, that could be that could be kind of a cue that I should look for Buddhism. Uh, Hinduism themes or icons in, in the in the visual language and in the story. So right, I, I, that's that's the specificity that I'm talking about. But yeah, yeah. I th- I think I think that there are two key sort of um, lenses to look through for this. One would be Eastern traditions, Eastern philosophy, Eastern religion. The other would be the Jungian lens, which would be uh, looking at it. I mean, the image of the lighthouse, the shadow, the Ouroboros, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. There are some elements there that you couldn't say, oh, that's Eastern specifically. I mean, I guess the mm-hmm. Ouroboros is originally Egyptian, so uh, maybe. It's but Occidental. Yeah, yeah, that's more of a... Uh, that's something that I think Jung brought up from the depths of history that could have faded that maybe is a little bit more crystallized now in the modern way of thinking that, that we might not be mentioning it without that sort of uh, excavation that he did. So yeah. I think we'll get into some of that stuff. Um, yeah. But a summary. You did the last one, so it's my turn. We'll take turns. I'm going to try. Go for it. I'm going to try, but if uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to attempt a summary, and then I'd like if you could, if I miss anything or, or if there's anything that's that should be there that's not, or anything that is in the book that should be added that would maybe shed some light on the discussion that's coming after. Because you read the yeah. book and I have not. Based on It's really good. The, f- the book is very good? 
I loved it. I I I fucking loved it. It was yeah, it was great. Yeah, have you read the whole three part series? I haven't. I'm waiting for the uh, one of the copies at the library <laughs> to. to show back up so got I got your go little library and, card waiting by the door I can't wait until the book oh comes man back. the library here is is great it, they, yeah. there's tons of ebooks and you know there's just they got a the, the Seattle Public Library system has a, a great body of uh, a great corpus yeah cool <laughs> <laughs> all right so Zoinks. so the film starts with a meteor some sort of comet could be an asteroid anyway a projectile from the sky similar to if you have if you have seen our or haven't seen our discussion of arrival it starts with the event the event the aliens landing this starts with the alien or whatever it is some sort of external outside alien thing smacking into the earth but not exactly smacking into the earth it specifically stops at a lighthouse which immediately sort of cues you to symbol look for symbols why is it a lighthouse why isn't it just some hole some place some field somewhere it's got to be a lighthouse for a reason so as soon as it hits this lighthouse it doesn't explode it starts to shimmer and in fact that's what this this effect this sort of phenomenon at this point is called this this shimmering effect begins to spread it begins to expand and it's this sort of uh, within which Within this thing, this shimmering effect, there is this bizarre phenomenon that we discover later uh, throughout throughout the film. Then we've got Natalie Portman, who is a, a biologist who studies cancer and uh, the morphology and uh, anatomy. She obviously is a scientist, and she has a husband who is missing or... At war, we don't know exactly. It turns out he's he he had gone into this phenomenon for some reason to try to understand it, and then we find out more about about that later. And she also has a uh, a relationship with one of her colleagues at the place where she works, and it turns out that's someone that she had an affair with at some point. So there's sort of this phenomenon this shimmering thing her husband who's not there this guy who we don't know is actually having an affair with her or had an affair at some point and then natalie portman's character uh uh lena who um seems to seems to be in a state of grief but actually mm -hmm. it's not grief maybe but i guess that's <laughs> more of the analysis it's more like it's more like guilt Right. So anyway, mm. is it guilt or is it grief? Huh, I hadn't really tried to divide the two things. I just kind of uh, it looks like it looks I, like both. Grief. she's yeah, she's I think it's both. She's she feels grief for her husband being gone. But then she also feels guilt for why he's gone and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, <clears throat> so then so then. Uh, her husband returns while she's painting their bedroom and uh, something is different about him. There's some foreshadowing when they're reaching for each other's hands. There's a, a refraction effect on their hands when they're reaching, reaching for each other's hands. Something is off about him. He's, he seems sort of distant and he doesn't seem to know where he came from or why he's there. He seems almost like a sort of a shell of a person. And then he starts bleeding. They, ru they rush to the hospital. And, or no, they, they, they're trying to rush to the hospital. And then mm -hmm. they're, overtaken yeah. by, they're overtaken by some sort of government agency. And she wakes up in this place where uh, they're studying the, the shimmering effect. And it's expanding. And she eventually feels the need to go into the phenomenon where her husband returned from to try to understand it because she says she owes him one, right? And the reason she owes him one is because she has guilt about the affair she had with the colleague at the place where she works. And that's why she feels she owes him. Anyway, he's not dead. He's there. And so she and 
four other women, including is it four or five? Yeah, four. Four other it's women, four, yeah. including the <clears throat> the director of this this project or the person who's essentially choosing the teams to go in and try to understand this thing, from which no one has ever returned and they can't get any signals back. <clears throat> She finally is is going to go in as well. The the leader of this project, which seems sort of strange, she seems like a very distant person. She seems sort of like sh she's paying attention to something something else. She's looking. She's sort of lost in her her gaze is um, far beyond the conversation she's actually in. She seems almost untethered to the situation she's in, whatever she's doing. Um, yeah. The director lady. So anyway, they all go in. And weird stuff starts happening. They find that the animals are mutating, the plants are mutating, and uh, there's something going on with the, with the DNA of the, the creatures. They're attacked by a monster, a sort of alligator-shark hybrid thingy. And uh, uh, later they start to realize that, these, these women start to realize that the um, effect is getting worse and worse the closer they get to the lighthouse. They're going toward the lighthouse where it sort of is emanating from and all of the people who are going toward this lighthouse are people who have serious issues. One one has a disease, one has lost a child. Uh, Natalie Portman's character, Lena, says it's grief of her dead husband. In fact, it's probably, it's probably maybe, maybe guilt and Everybody seems to have some major issue, and they, <clears throat> as they move closer, they start to <clears throat> realize. Cough. <laughs> they yeah, they start coughing because because um, the pollen, their allergies take effect, and they <laughs> then they turn around and they leave, and everything's fine. <laughs> take some, uh, yep, some theraflu, and then they're good. Uh, and then they one by one drop off in a very Charlie and the Chocolate Factory sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> it really is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory for grown-ups. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end, you're left with, with Natalie Portman reaching the, the lighthouse, and she gets to the lighthouse. Uh, the, the leader of the group got there too ahead of her, and she finds... She finds in the lighthouse uh, these bizarre crystal, crystalline trees around it. She finds in the lighthouse um, the bones of someone who has been, who is sort of sitting in a lotus posture against the wall. Looks like there's been some kind of explosion. There's a video camera in front of that. She sees there her husband, who has been to this place as well, blowing himself up. The person behind the camera is a copy of her husband a duplicate of her husband then she goes into this hole where the leader i forget the leader's name shepherd no ventress ventress the leader yeah. of this team um is in there and sh we have found out by now that she has cancer that she is dying of cancer and the reason she went in there is because she's essentially she wants to kill herself. She wants to annihilate herself, and she basically is consumed by whatever this alien essence is inside of this lighthouse that has impacted here, that is causing this whole effect. Uh, so, so whatever this is caused her husband to kill himself, caused Ventress, the leader of this group, to be consumed willingly, and has then caused her to well have whatever happens at the end of the movie which is to do you want to try to explain the thing that happens at the end because it's really it's very strange okay you mean with the the, the mandala uh... the so so the 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 ventress lady dissolves into this stuff that mm -hmm. turns into a mandala a sort of oh uh, that oscillating, gyrating mandala that Natalie Portman's character looks into directly. And then from that is created a duplicate of herself mm -hmm. in the same way that her husband had a duplicate, but it doesn't look like her yet. It's a sort of blank slate duplicate that copies her, her, her motions. And she realizes that everything she does to try to kill it, it does exactly, but stronger, right? So yeah. she tries to... Uh, 
push herself against the wall and it pushes itself against her more strongly she tries to hit it it hits her it hit her it hits her and knocks her down it's much more powerful than she is but it's copying all of her movements and finally it looks like she blows it up with a grenade in the same way that her husband blew himself up with a grenade and then everything burns down and throughout all of this she's being interviewed by <clears throat> Uh, Doctor Strange's friend Wong, <laughs> uh, who's who's a great character in Doctor Strange, interviewed by that guy about how it is that oh, she yeah. took this whole thing down. Right? How did she? How did she collapse this whole alien thing? Because it all burns down. Mm. But we see at the end that actually she has maybe mutated herself, and she she may be it and. Mm -hmm. Also, her husband, who has now recovered, may also be it. And there's a lot more going on there that we can, I think, discuss. But anyway, what did I miss? It's tough to summarize. Yeah, no, that was pretty thorough. That was pretty good. It hit all the highlights and things worth Except talking about. Except for the bear thing I forgot sure. to mention. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, with the, like the crocodile and the bear, um, there's kind of two animals that kind of attack. Yeah. So, um, no, that was pretty well covered. I was going to say... If I'm going to talk about the book, I mean, are you ever going to read it? Are you ever going to listen to it? Or what do you think? Cause let's I don't, say, if, let's it's... say no for the purposes of the conversation. I want to know okay. what, what's different. I must know. Yeah. Uh, so I have I have a friend who had read the book <clears throat> and seen the movie. And, and she was saying that she liked the book a lot more than the movie. But she understood why they did what they did in the movie. And now after having read the book, I, I understand what she means. And I bring that up because... They did a, a pretty fantastic job trying to pull in, I think, the ideas that the book conveyed. And the way the book did it was to do some of that in a film format. You'd need more time. It would just be confusing for a viewer. It would be too strange. The movie, I think, to me, covered most of the points that you can. Um, a couple. You want to know just a couple of differences for example? I do. I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. So there's no crocodile and there's no bear. Okay. Um, there is a spoilers ahead just for anybody who doesn't want to know these things. Go read the book and watch the movie and then come back. But um, don't come instead back. of a we crocodile, say what? I said don't come back. We don't want you. <laughs> uh, so instead of a crocodile, there is a dolphin that's swimming kind of inland. I think there's two dolphins, and one of them rolls over near where – uh, Natalie Portman's character in the book is walking and when it kind of turns over when it rolls it's got a human eyeball Whoa, um, that's pretty cool instead of yeah yeah instead of a bear it's a boar that comes up against them if they see it they see it far off and it just starts charging the four of the the group and then it veers off to the left really fast so there's no bear and there's no crocodile I think boars are scary Boars yeah. and sea cucumbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and subway cucumbers. <laughs> so. Uh, That's a, it's yeah. a code name for, for, for homeless people who poop on the subway. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing in the book is that there's only four characters that go into the shimmer and they have no names. They're just. They, they don't even they never mentions their name they never mention their names to each other uh, there is only the psychology there were going to be five so there, there were going to be the uh, a linguist a psychologist a biologist uh, an anthropologist and a surveyor but before they all go in the linguist doesn't get chosen to go in something happens in the interview process and they get kind of kicked out so how do, they, how do they refer to them they, in the book then? Do they just say their occupation every time? You need to refer to characters in this in a story, right? How, how are they referred to? Just by their titles. Oh, okay. So they don't have this identity of a, a human, like this this person, this full functioning, you know, multifaceted human. It's just a a, a, a human with a task, and that's it. So. Right. And it works. It's it's never strange. It's totally fine. Um, Do you get the same then suggestion that those those could potentially all be facets of one individual going through a process? 
Yeah, I tried to I tried to look at the book that way too. Not as much as I did with the movie, but it makes yeah, it makes sense. I, I mean, I would love to read the story again and go back through it with that idea. So I can't really be an authority. I didn't really think of it that way when I was reading the book. But um, the psychologist is she is the the ringleader. Mm-hmm. And one funny thing is that she puts all of the characters under hypnosis before they go in, and uh, and she'll suggest things. She'll say phrases to them when they're inside the shimmer in the book to get them to act a certain way, to keep them calm or to do these kind of specific tasks. Hmm. That's very interesting. And Yeah. And so if you remember at the beginning when they first get through the shimmer and they kind of wake up four days later, they all say, oh, what? how did we get here? How long have we been here? I don't remember coming through. I don't remember thing, anything after entering. Okay. But you don't have to read the book to know that stuff. Right. Um, but I bring that up because it explains why Jennifer Jason Lee's character, Ventress, says annihilation at when she's down in the that womb kind of I thought they just wanted to squeeze the, the movie title in there that she says it for yeah, another reason yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it's fine it works it's um and the the way that she does it in the book is different than the way she does it in the movie and I think the way they do it in the movie it, it, it adds a little bit more interest like you can there's more to think about because of the way she does it so okay. um in the book in the book, the Natalie Portman's character is the biologist, and she she doesn't cheat on her husband. She and her husband just kind of start to move away from each other because he's this gregarious, outgoing guy, kind of like Oscar Isaac is in the in the movie, and she's more just reserved and a kind of a bookworm and yeah, is it doesn't open up a lot. And so there's that there, that's where the rift in their marriage starts. And so then he goes off to go do the, the sh- enter the shimmer in area X and go check that stuff out. And then, uh, yeah, he, man, I can't remember if he comes back now. I don't, yeah, he does. He doesn't come back in the book. Is he, is he but, hurt in the hospital when she gets there or in the, in the hmm. center when she gets there? That doesn't happen. But I think that's, uh, that's a pretty important part of the movie. At least that's how it, that's how it hit me sort of, uh, if if it's read as a as a journey through the psyche as we we would read say um um what's the movie that we watched the Jake Gyllenhaal movie that we watched enemy enemy uh it's kind of i i see it very similar to it, it it's kind of similar to yeah. that i mean you could look at it that way it's a it's a female version of enemy in enemy it's this guy coming to grips with his change in role as a man becoming a family man from a single man and maybe dealing with infidelity as a, a sort of a natural instinct that he may have to either suppress or or bring within himself right so i kind of see this it could be read in the same way but I sort of a, yeah. a, a an opposite reflection of it because not only is it a woman who is uh, in this case cheating on her husband who is away and so she feels very guilty and I saw that as sort of the central struggle that he, she has not not sorrow that he's gone but but this guilt that is gnawing at her but also that rather than in enemy Jake Gyllenhaal trying to push down the aspect of himself that causes him to cheat on his spouse. Natalie Portman's character, very interestingly, accepting the part of herself that makes her Mm. cheat on her husband. Not that cheating is a good thing, but maybe it's good for her because the, the person who she cheats with, the colleague, he is a, he seems like a very virtuous character, a very virtuous man. And he's willing to cheat on his wife, and uh, he feels no guilt about cheating on his wife, as though he's sort of this, not a, not a Buddha character, but enlightened in the sense that I know why I'm cheating on my wife. I love my wife, too. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man with certain needs. I understand myself. I know that society views this as bad, but I accept this thing about myself. I'm a guy, 
and I want to I want to cheat on my wife with you. I enjoy it, right? It's it's something I know about myself. <laughs> Uh -huh. This is how I read it. And so when yeah, yeah, Natalie yeah. Portman feels this angst and this guilt about cheating on her husband, even though maybe this was a very genuine act, I sort of saw it as by the end, now maybe she understands the part of herself that made her want to do that. And maybe mm. her inclination to cheat on her husband with this guy completes her as a person, even though it's not viewed by society as acceptable. Uh, maybe she now she can sort of accept this aspect of herself before she had this gnawing guilt because this is a thing that you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to cheat on your husband. But maybe now she tells her husband, who is kind of a shell of a man now, hey, listen, you know, I want to have an open marriage. I know this cool guy who I like having sex with sometimes, and I'm interested in exploring a relationship with him, but I also want to be married to you. This is an adult kind of thing to think. This is a this is a, a thing that maybe stands outside of ethics, but might be part of her understanding who she is in a sort of Jungian sort of way. Does that make sense? Hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 I, and I think in uh, in the book, she's not she doesn't cheat on her husband. She just is really distant, and that's pretty much it. They and they just they have well. And, and when uh, the professor colleague mentions to Natalie Portman, you know, she says something like your husband can't tell you about his job. You can't talk to him about your job. So you don't have this mental connection with each other, but you and I professor to professor, we do have that mm -hmm. mental connection. So you can, you know, that part of your life is sort of satiated or fulfilled. And, and, and then, uh, I may, I don't know if, did you understand that the timeline is that she has been having this affair while her husband has been away and then he comes back uh, and then he gets chosen to go to or he actually I don't know I think he volunteers to go to Area X because he found out about the affair and now right. he wants to go away okay yeah so he wants Got to go that. away and that's sort of yeah the <clears throat> the rift in their relationship is what drove him to go to Area X and it sounds like at this point people kind of understand that it's a suicide mission. I don't, I don't know in the movie, um, in the book, I can't remember how much they talk about it being a suicide mission, but, um, so when she says that she owes him, you know, when, when the copy is laying on the, the doctor's slab or whatever, she means that now I understand that my decisions drove you to go to area X. So I owe it to you to go to area X to figure out what's wrong with you so I can fix you. Okay. It's kind of a, that's, that's interesting. the way I read it. Yeah, I, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that too. I see that too. I definitely read it a different way though. I read it more as okay. gnawing guilt has forced me yeah. to take an action that will hopefully allow me to redeem myself. I sort of see it as uh, two journeys into um, two journeys into themselves. Uh, maybe when he finds out that his wife is cheating on him, he has to sort of go within himself to try to understand what that means in terms of his manhood, in terms of his future or whatever that might be, hmm. because there's been there's been an imbalance an offset is created. And um, I've, I've been reading recently uh, Psychology of the Unconscious and it's, it's, it's man, it's good um, by Carl Jung and what are you reading at <clears throat> Psychology of the Unconscious. By Carl Jung. Okay. Yeah, it's it's good, um, and it's it's sort of like I mean it's 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 all about whatever puts the the ego off its axis uh, creates a series of monsters that only diving into yourself and mm. uh, confronting the monsters will correct right so. Both of yeah. them need to go into the the abyss, right? Both of them have to go through this journey. But there, that's why, that's why when she's when they see if if you view the film as sort of this, and when if she is this person going within herself or going into her own abyss to try to understand this whole situation with her husband, then you have to view the other characters that are with her as part of herself, sort of facets of herself. 
and she's yeah. going yeah. farther and farther and facing monsters and realizing she's in this place that 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 is bizarre and strange to her because these are elements of herself that are sort of buried and deep and she's going toward this lighthouse this the lighthouse is the thing which shines the way forward which is supposed to be your compass which is supposed to be where you're going right Mm -hmm. But it's obscured, and it's you don't know where it is, and you don't know which way it's pointing. And when you look at your own compass, it's pointing in all sorts of different directions. You don't know what's going on. So each of them yeah. are going into this place. He's gone there before her, and that's why you see the video of him cutting open one of his companions. Like He's going through some, some pretty heavy stuff and some confusing things to get to finally get to the lighthouse. When he gets to the lighthouse... He, his realization is different than her realization. His realization, and, and maybe you have something to say about the different things that happen in terms of um, the Asian philosophy or A Asian re uh, religious viewpoint on this, but sort of his, his process takes him to essentially a point where um, once he returns, he's no longer at all the person that he was as a husband. And hers maybe leads her to a point where she's more fulfilled, not as a wife, but as a person. Uh, she seems to be more alive than he is, and he seems to be less alive than he was. So I don't know if he was defeated by that process, but it seems like they went through the same process and faced the same monsters or had to deal with the same sort of inner demons and just came out with slightly different different outcomes. She she understood it and came back and and eventually burned it down he he decided to self immolate essentially because maybe the truth that was revealed to him was too much to bear yeah yeah exactly uh um so so what yeah what he does when he self immolates with that phosphorus grenade it seems like like you said he's reached the center and he's sort of faced his shadow or because uh, when they get to the center we and Natalie Portman's character has to fight the lighthouse when she gets there she has to fight this kind of black obelisk formica shaded or textured kind of organic rock alien but then it that is takes, herself it mirrors yeah. yeah it mirrors her every move and um and so we can assume that everybody that reaches the lighthouse has to interact with some form of themselves. They they find the center, and I, I mean, they have to go down into the abyss because they go down into this that sort of birth canal shaped hole in the lighthouse, and then they go down into a womb area. And funny enough, the the name Ventress means belly, stomach, or womb. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and there's a couple of things that could be cool to wrap your head around with the psychologist's name. But so she has to do it because we see her, we see Ventress. She has to go and she has to face her own demon, but she takes care of it one way. Well, Natalie well, Portman obviously does it. Well, let's let huh? go through the different ways because I think that's yeah. uh, meaningful in its own right. So uh, I yeah, talked about sure. Natalie Portman's Port, Port, Portman, Natalie Portman, uh, <laughs> Natalie Portman's character who, yeah. uh, uh, I saw in your notes you called a bodhisattva. I think that's a fair mm -hmm. comparison. Someone who yeah. confronts the inner demon, becomes enlightened, and returns to share uh, with a room pe of people in hazmat suits. Uh, that's what bodhisattvas yeah, do. They, right. they only talk to people in hazmat suits after they after they come back from enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what about uh, the other the other characters? Because each one sort of has their own exit from the situation in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory scenario. Yeah. So Kane, which is Natalie Portman's husband's character in the movie, he yeah. he self immolates. So he chooses. It seems like he gets overwhelmed he learns the truth and he gets so overwhelmed and eager for an exit from the idea of being trapped in this identity of who i am because he, he sits there he he when they're film when she finds the camera she watches the film of him he grabs a phosphorus grenade he sits on the floor in the lotus position and then he starts talking about who am i what's my identity my skin is like liquid my mind has been cut loose 
um, am I you or are you me? I used to think I was a man, but people called me Cain, but now I don't know anymore. And then he blows himself up with a phosphorus grenade. And Campbell talks about this idea of nirvana being uh, translated into burnt out. So uh, literally, it's right there on screen. And then we're left with that shell of Cain. Uh, he walks into the frame in the video, and then he's the one that returns to Natalie Portman you know, at the, at their home. Yeah. Uh, Natalie Portman, she seems like the Bodhisattva because she's faced her inner demon, but instead of, I don't know, she, she defeats her shadow, but there's also, cause she seems, she blows it up with the phosphorus grenade, but then she comes back. She sort of incorporated it into herself because when she comes back to the husk of her husband, both of their eyes kind of glow. Right. So she's got it in her. And then in I the think book, that's that's that, supposed to be obvious. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in the book, that's very obvious too because she talks about having this light inside of her after she. Uh, I think she gets exposed to these spores. She starts to talk about this light inside of her. So there's that. So she incorporates it, and then Ventress. That's I feel that I feel that way she, whenever I eat Danny's pizza. <laughs> is is that a local chain? It's one and only Danny's Pizza. If you ever visit New York, right. I'll take you. Yeah, I'm working on it. It's the for world's sure. best That's pizza. Something I want to do. Um, but Ventress, she's interesting because she goes down into. We find her in the womb, and the first shot we see of her down there is of her body looks fine, her hair is fine, but her face is that black, kind of formica obelisk dark material that the alien that assuming it's an alien is. And she says that the, we're going to be destroyed by this new thing that's come out of space. And then she, you see, she says annihilation. And I'll explain that in a second. And then the light wells up in her chest and she starts to spew all this light out of her, out of her body. And she just dematerializes. She kind of shrivels up like a prune and, and, just becomes pure light. Yeah, she becomes so, the next the next iteration of the thing, whatever it is. Yeah, she becomes and, the mandala, the fractal mandala. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah or is it or is it like a Buddha, like a uh, uh, Amida, Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha, the light Buddha, uh, mm-hmm. Namu An- Namu Amida Butsu is what you say to the. Mm-hmm. So are we looking at manifestations of of the Buddha? Because you have the self-immolation, which is the mm-hmm. uh, the first Buddha, which is the it's Buddha nirvana. who enters in uh, nirvana, and that that Buddha is slightly lower in status than the uh, Bodhisattva Buddha who returns mm-hmm. to share knowledge, and then there's the uh, the joyful the joyful Buddha, the 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 Buddha of light. Yeah. Yeah, and. And so, yeah, Jennifer Jason Lee's character just kind of dissolves into this light and then this other material. And that is an interesting thing to bring up because the idea of Manichaeanism, are you familiar with that? Um, I know the word Manichaeanism, but that's, so yes, but no, I don't know anything about it. I know man. I know mannequin. <laughs> um, Ma- let me remember. guess, wait, let me guess. It's the, um, it's a, it's a dance that mannequins do at night after the store closes and they sort of, they do sort of a square dance. And if you look at the window, you say, Oh my God, look at the Manichaeanism in there is, um, slightly creepy and, but something to behold. Is that right? <laughs> that's, ex- that's, that's my it. Guess. You nailed it. I, yeah, you do know it. Uh, Manichaeanism is the idea that before, I think, I think it's that before there was a fall into being and all this light, there was like a perfect state and there was a fall and all the light got trapped in these physical bodies. And so our physical bodies are made up of light. And so in Manichaeanism, you sure you're not talking about Gnosticism. Is, that sounds like Gnosticism. There's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, there, I was going to mention there's a, in Tantrism, it's there too. Uh, and in, so in, in the Manichaeanism, the goal of life is to release the light from the body because it's trapped in the body. So you want these light bodies. And then in tantrism, there's this connection between these, the multicolored light and sex and the, the release of uh, seminal fluid. So what's that? We think, 
um, <laughs> there's, uh, uh, yeah. So looking at the, the visuals they use down there, there's all of these cues to the Manichaeanism. There's all the cues to the Tantrism and all that building into an idea of salvation and specifically regeneration because mm-hmm. we're making these new bodies. We might be making a new Buddha because, um, Apparently, it seems like Cain has. It seems like Cain saw that thing down there. The thing down in there can take any form or any shape, um, and it's light. It is, it's just very bright, and so yeah. Is that well? The, the, of, the symbolism oh, makes a lot of sense because I mean, in the film, I can't speak for the for the book, but but um, it, she she is essentially talking about rebirth. Then you have. Natalie Portman's tattoo, which is slowly forming throughout the film, which is the Earl Burroughs, essentially, which means creation and rebirth, and that this is happening in a lighthouse, which could be certainly regarded as some form of axis mundi, which is where the sky meets the terrestrial realm, right? So you have yeah. you have the world navel or the world tree, and you have a All symbol. Bottles. You have a symbol of um, of rebirth or of renewal and you have then her talking about annihilation and and rebirth and something new happening a new a new species or a new consciousness or a new a new person or a, mm-hmm. a, a renewal of self if you if we're talking about sort of the the jungian concept of of confronting your shadow incorporating yeah. your shadow and and returning as a a bodhisattva from that from that process so it's all sort of symbolically tied together with the lighthouse and the tattoo and her her statement yeah and it's interesting that they chose a lighthouse on a borderline between the ocean and land yeah kind of like in true detective we've got this play between the unknown which is the ocean it's where everything all life came from and then we've got the land which is everything that we can see and it's kind of got hard structure and it's formed and it's interesting you mentioned the auroboros because the anya the the heavy like the the um the paramedic who gets killed by the bear first yeah. she has that tattoo on her arm she so, gets killed by the bear second but yeah yeah you're right you're right yeah yeah and so she has that tattoo on her arm throughout the film natalie portman gains that tattoo and she starts to gain it after she meets the crocodile um because then she's there on the boats and then she's scratching her arms. Oh, I got this bruise. I don't know what it is. And that's the tattoo coming into being. So somehow she is gaining, I don't know, an aspect of, of Anya is yeah. or at least a physical manifestation, but yeah, yeah, Anya's I think DNA, I, th- I think that's what it's supposed to be. I don't think it, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it could be her, her DNA, but she's, it could be an incorporation of that aspect of herself. If it's viewed as this whole group of people are uh, uh, components or aspects of one one person, but it could also be just a rem- it could be a visual reminder of the concept of of renewal. I mean, in in Charlie yeah. and the Chocolate Factory, you, it is the same thing. They are telling the same story. That, that's not a joke. They are trying to tell I, the I, same story. I don't they, it. Well, each so they all go into the into the chocolate factory, this secret place that no one has ever entered before. That's been closed to the outside. These these children get these tickets. These lucky children get these tickets, and they get to enter this mysterious place that has hitherto been unseen by the public. And one by one, they get picked off by their own vices. Hmm. By ironically, their own vices. The fat kid gets stuck in a tube when he's trying to drink from the chocolate river, and the uh, the selfish brat uh, girl gets uh, flushed down a uh, a funnel th- when she tries to get a golden a golden goose egg because she wants one. She demands one of her father, and everyone gets sort of destroyed by the thing that by their fatal flaw, by their maybe their Achilles heel or the the yeah. the, the their they are destroyed. Their self-destruction is caused by their fatal flaw, the thing that they didn't recognize within themselves. If they had recognized it, they might have avoided it, but they didn't, and so they're destroyed by it. And so it's the same theme that's tied into it. And as he moves closer, or as Charlie moves closer to the end of the tour of the factory, uh, he, the, he discovers 
that he's the one who has to carry the torch forward. He's the one who has to be the new person in charge of the chocolate factory, mm -hmm. who's going to take over. And he has to go through these sort of trials and get closer and closer to the center and pass a final test before he can assume the mantle. So it's actually a very similar story in a lot of ways. And um, I don't think that parallel will will resonate with most people who hear that. But I, when I was watching it, I was thinking, geez, this is really similar to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> if uh, I just want to put slapstick comedy sound effects and laugh tracks behind Annihil Annihilation now. <laughs> <laughs> there, are no slap like there are no slapstick uh, sound effects in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I think it's a movie to be taken seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm thinking of the old one, not the. You're thinking of the Tim Burton one. No, I, the Tim Burton one blows. I'm talking about the old one. The old one is good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. All the right. old one is the uh, one to pay attention to. The new one is is dumb. Uh, but you mentioned uh, you mentioned the fact that it's interesting that it's by the sea. Uh, I I was sort of grappling with that in the last discussion I had with my brother about. Uh, we were. We were talking about Tree of Life, and there's this sort of nebulous end scene where everybody's on the beach together by the sea, and it's very unclear what it's all about, but it is by the sea, and the film starts off with the Book of Job, with a verse from the Book of Job about mm. sort of um, uh, God's statement to Job about where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth. And so it's this sort of general impression of this line between the known and the unknown, between this immense thing that you don't understand and what you do understand, mm -hmm. and also between, I think, the source of life, which is where we came from as living creatures from the sea, ultimately, is where we started, out of this place into uh, something that was a little more hospitable, maybe. And when we go to the sea, we feel this familiarity with our origin, with our, the place of our origin. Well, do you think, just speaking of Tree of Life, do you think that them being on the shore is that idea of the other shore, like Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhism, where one means large vehicle, one means little vehicle, but mm -hmm. um, you're both, it's the idea of trying to reach enlightenment, the other shore, where there's like a paradise, and then when you get there, everybody's waiting, like it's heaven. It's sort of that idea. So that's when Tree of Life talk comes up and there's the shore thing that's what i, I think about but. yeah that, that that could definitely be certainly and there are a lot of ways to to interpret that i mean there are a lot of yeah. also buddhist sort of uh imagery in that film even though it's visually <clears throat> supposed to be more christian in the way that it's presented with the bible verses and prayers and yeah. you know, talking to god essentially throughout the film it is it has a lot of imagery from from buddhism and eastern thought i thought it did anyway um yeah uh, I think with, we've, yeah. Well, I was going to say with the light kind of to continue, just pull out a couple more images from the film talking about that rebirth idea. Natalie Portman, when she's being interviewed by Dr. Strange's sidekick, uh, mm -hmm. she says, or he says, did it, did it, what did it want? Was it, why did it attack you? Uh, it was here to, it was obviously here to destroy things. And she said, well, I don't think it was here to destroy anything. I think it was just here to make something new. Which again, it's that like in her personality, she takes all the pieces get divided and then they come back together until they get reformed into this new thing, kind of like her DNA is going through the same kind of process. It's kind of being deconstructed and then re recombinated or recombined into a different form. So uh, that's and, and on that point, and you know, I want, like what's what's your take on it? Thinking about well, okay, so. If the other four characters in the movie are parts of her personality, how could we, how do we define those? I mean, it seems like. So let's combine that Shepard. and the question of the fact that they're all women. Let's sort of combine those two points. Yeah. Can I start it with one thing? Please so do. In the, in the book, in the book, the four characters that the bio, Natalie Portman and her cohorts in the book, there's four of them, and they are the 12th excursion or expedition that's gone into the shimmer over the course of something like 30 years. I don't remember what the timeline is in the movie. Not long. The shimmers. Yeah. Yeah. Three the years. In the book three is, years. It's okay. three. So the shimmer in the book has been there for something like 30 years and there's been 11 previous expeditions and 
the one we're in on is the 12th. And I was I was listening to Joseph Campbell the other day, and he was saying that anytime you see the number 12, it's a solar journey, which means it's a journey of enlightenment, like the 12 disciples. That's an enlightenment story. And so thinking about, well, does that work for this movie? And it seems to, because it's all about enlightenment and consciousness. So that's kind of, in the book, Very it, was, interesting. it was clear that it was 12. So I think that knowing what the movie is about too, it seems to reinforce that idea that we're talking about coming to a, a realization of yourself and self-actualization as Jung would put it. You seems like they would have, ah, I'm bringing you over to my side, my pronunciation <laughs> side. Hey, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> Welcome. I, I think, I think well, you're one I of those, you're one of those bastards who young, say data, yeah. don't you? Aren't you? You're, you're one of those guys. I'm a mix, a mixed bag. <laughs> uh, Sorry, what were you going to say before I interrupted you? Data? No. Oh. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, That's upsetting. Yeah, well, you, we were going to get into the women. why is it all women. Why is it all women? Kind yeah. Of stuff. yeah, so that's where you were going to go. I just wanted to start it off with, okay, well, it's a, it's well, a journey was, of enlightenment. I wasn't going to go there. I was going to ask you uh, oh. what you made of that. I don't, I don't know, other than in the movie, it's seems like they make it a point that the first expeditions were more about power and military. And so maybe, a, I don't know, a masculine aspect, typically masculine aspect, whereas this one is all women and it's, and it's also all scientists. So maybe, and it's, and it's, so I don't know if that's just supposed to highlight the difference of this particular mission in contrast to the previous missions that have gone and kind of failed. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it certainly, uh, I, in the first 30 seconds of seeing the away team, thought, well, why, why, what, I mean, what is this, some sort of political statement? And then I realized, 30 seconds later, this, no, this is, there is something else going on here, there's, there's a deeper thread to pay attention yeah. to, to uh, ask why it is. One reason might be, again, I know I've sort of mentioned it too many times, but that we could look on each character as a flawed part of herself that needs to be sloughed off, in a sense, in order to reach the lighthouse, in order to reach the center, in order to mm. sort of clean the grime off of the 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 bulb of the of the light, so that it can shine the way. Uh, m you know, more clearly and actually be of use so that the compass points in the right direction, that these are sort mm. of these things, these clingers on, these sort of sucker fish that need to be sort of scraped away before she gets to the main issue, right? And one is this suicidal girl, one is someone who's confronted loss, one is, you know, all of these, they, they're, they're very archetypal in their formulation. And so making them all women seems to sort of make it easier to see it that way whereas if it were m women and men then you'd be it would be kind of convoluted as a mm. as a way of viewing it that way and i mean the more i watched the film the more it it was that way to me very clearly uh, to the mm. point where wh by the time the bear showed up i was i was and it's not usually something that i do watching the film completely symbolically Mm. <laughs> Usually I'm the other way. Usually I just watch a movie like a like a like a like a two year old. It's oh, as a bear, and you know the next thing happens, and I'm, I usually do that. But the I think the the way that the the elements were keyed in at the right time uh, sort of made me look at it as I was watching it through certain lenses. Um, yeah, and the, you know, meteor hits lighthouse. Ah, pay attention. Uh, f five women, each with a specific problem, goes into an obscuring layer of reality. Ah, pay attention. You know, there's it, it's it's sort of purposely, I think, slaps you over the head, not because it's trying to be obvious, but because it's trying to prepare you mentally with the right lenses. So by the time you get to this very strange ending which is not so overt and obvious, you're at least you have the lenses ready to view it in some way that makes sense. Because if you're trying yeah. to watch the end of the film literally, then it's really stupid. 
<laughs> well, there's a there's <laughs> yeah. this sort of yeah. Uh, there's this sort of uh, mica person who's uh, who, uh, uh, a Muscovite mica person who's copying her movements, and then she catches on fire, and then the trees catch on yeah. fire, and then she's fine. <laughs> it's so dumb. And, and it's weird. It's dumb if you and watch it like that. Kind yeah. of. A, yeah. Sorry, uh, I was gonna say their their fight is kind of a dance. It, I mean, yeah. it, they they kind of dance with each other. To me, it wasn't you know a, a rock 'em sock 'em. For jabs sure. and uppercuts kind of fight so yeah it, was, it, it uh, would look silly kind of if you don't have any preparation for okay this is symbolical or symbolic right i mean i think it's almost it's almost dumb if it's not seen in that way <laughs> if you're if you're not sort of adequately ready to see the end in that way then the end yeah. is very stupid <laughs> yeah uh so did you did you try to parse out or can you put a name to or describe? I, I, I'd i like to try with you and see what you think. Like, okay, Anya, the heavy, the paramedic, the one that picks up the, the 50 caliber machine gun, what part of uh, Lena's personality is she? Is, uh, to me, I don't, I don't know. Do you want to do that? Does it well, sound... I, 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 that's a good project, but that hopefully that's something that the book covers more because I just don't think there's enough material to go yeah. on for that. You know what I mean? Like, I would want to sure. say in what argument that she had with her husband, could I see that piece of her come out? Right. Yeah. And I, I was looking for that and I was trying to see that. And, and, and there, then there's the grieving uh, mother whose daughter died of leukemia in what yeah conversation that she had with someone else previously would that part come out the only part i can see is mm. that she's grieving for maybe her husband but then again i didn't see it as the way you saw it i saw it more as this sort of um if your parent called you and you didn't answer the phone i don't want to say your parent if a parent called their child and the child said i don't want to answer right now and then they got killed in a car accident Oh my God! You would never, you would never be able to to live with that. I could have yeah. answered the phone and had a last conversation, and I didn't, and that guilt would crush you. So, so I saw the whole thing as that conflict within her about, you know, my husband is gone and I'm having sex with this guy, not not realizing that yeah. she should be having sex with this guy because he's a cool, he's a nice guy. Um, <laughs> but um, that was something that you know, could have suggested the lady, I forget her name, Shepard, is Shepard. It could have suggested the lady She's whose daughter died of leukemia as that part of herself who's grieving for someone who's gone. Yeah, and so, and, and, and that might be perfect. So Shepard is the, the grieving part of herself. Anya, the paramedic, the the woman who picks up the fifty caliber machine gun, she's the military part of, the military part of herself, the aggressive, you know, she spent... Lena spent seven years in the military, and then uh, Radic, she would be the the scientist part of herself because she's a biologist, and then the psychologist. I don't know why, where would maybe she's the part just trying to figure it all out. I don't know. Maybe that's one of the another one of the cues that we're supposed to pick out. I mean, so in the book, this maybe this is it. So Ventress in the book as well, the psychologist is kind of the ego part in a Freudian sense, the ego of the super ego that's telling her, do this, don't do that. Literally, um, the psychologist puts them under hypnosis. So when she says something, they have to do it. Like mm -hmm. I, I forgot what she, one thing she says makes them calm in, uh, extenuating circumstances. So they keep their cool. And then I forgot to mention it, but when she says annihilate, if, uh, Ventress, character in the book says annihilation then it induces whoever hears it to commit suicide so back to that lighthouse scene when ventress is down there and she's changing and then she says annihilation that she's committing suicide herself even though she's kind of both parts her original self ventress and that new alien part are kind of in the same character she says annihilation and commits the suicide but anyway she seems to be kind of maybe a, a super ego aspect mm -hmm. that Lena has the, you know, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Lena has to get past that view so that she can become, she can take control of everything or of her life or her mind. Yeah, that makes sense. 
that makes sense. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to I guess it's hard to obviously see it that way with just the film to go on, right? But I I try to look at her as the externalization. Well, so as soon as you find out that she's dying of cancer, then the landscape becomes a more interesting part of the story. The trees yeah. with the bizarre lichen, colorful lichens growing and the parasites that have exploded that person in half, basically. And and everything that you see has suddenly become the malignancy inside of this person. And this mm-hmm. woman is walking through her own cancer, essentially, trying to come, yeah. not come to terms with it, but trying to come to terms with the fact that this is going to end with her her end right so so there's a very uh physical sort of manifestation of what's going on inside of her because cancer is all around them the film is somehow about cancer cancer a it's a tumor and but i mean the other the other aspect of cancer there is that what cancer is cancer is the most devious of all diseases whereas if a virus comes and kills you it's a thing coming from the outside that kills you but if you get cancer and you die, you kill yourself in the most perverse and strange way by using the natural processes of nature, cell replication, gone awry. You essentially, your body is, is, is committing a mutiny against itself and doesn't, and doesn't even know that that's a bad thing. It just keeps on going yeah. and isn't able to stop it in the same way as you move closer toward the lighthouse, well, before I guess before I mention the lighthouse thing, in general, there are tendencies that we all have towards self-destruction, which is a major theme in the film. Self-destruction is kind of what the whole movie is about. And she mentions at some point we all either smoke or we drink or we do something that's that's destructive. And And maybe we do those things that are destructive until we have a thing that's actually self-destructive which is actually destroying us like cancer right and it's sort of a it's sort of a reminder that that we don't need cancer to destroy ourselves we have a tendency whenever whenever the 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 thing is slightly off balance in the psyche deep within us then then all kinds of problems begin to surface and these problems are primordial problems that probably arise from our ancient ancestors deep within the collective unconscious that sort of don't fit within the the lens of modernity I, I, yeah. I mean, right now reading about that in Jung and how how uh, we we're disgusted by things that disgust us we're disgusted to hear about bestiality and we're disgusted to hear about uh, uh, there's a there's a a part about sodomy and there's a part about um, uh, incest these things disturb us deeply but the question that's that that is interesting if we're honest with ourselves is why are they there they come from mm-hmm. this sort of primordial depths of various ancestors that for some reason evolutionary or otherwise engaged in these things for evolutionary reasons and when they bubble to the surface they create a conflict and sort of a try to fit themselves through the bottleneck of modern consciousness, which is not able to to understand them, which is not able to sort of put them in a in a sort of little neat a neat little box uh, that we have in our sort of ethical code, which makes sense because our ethical code can't be infinitely large. But when these things bubble to the surface, if we aren't able to either release them and say, well, that's just a part of a part of myself, then w- w- then that that's that creates a complex right and so the concept of cancer being this thing that uh will destroy you you destroying yourself if you don't understand it if you if you can't come to grips with it is something that i think in the film is manifested both physically and mm-hmm. sort of as a suggestion of what's happening throughout the story of her trying to reach the lighthouse and cut through uh maybe these these destructive elements in herself if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that talking about the self-destructive things in the movie, we've got, uh, well, at the beginning, she's talking about, this is, this is interesting. At the beginning, we're, we, uh, when... It's, it's interesting? All right. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Can't I'm wait. Sure of it. A thousand percent. Uh, 
at the beginning when Lena is teaching in the school, they're looking at the, the video of the cancer cells in it from a young woman there in a, uh, from her cervix. Mm. And then later in the movie, reading the book, Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And that book is about, is a, a biography of, uh, I think it was a female scientist who, no, it's a bio, It's a story about a female scientist who learned about Henrietta Lacks who died from cervical cancer. So there's kind of that self-reference. And then they get it, springboarding from that, they talk about the genes encoded self-destruct mechanism. It's just there. And when they're talking about those, the genes, at the beginning, she's mentioning the, at, at one time there was one, and then there were two, and then there were four, and then there were eight, and then, in the self-dividing pair <clears throat> there is the the hindu myth or the it's a vedic hindu i forgot which period it's from but there's a myth about the the self and at one point there was only the self and it thought well here am i and then it brought right hmm? the uh the brahman right was the, the i don't remember yeah okay anyway i don't remember exactly so the uh the self Atman. Atman. Yeah, yeah. Atman is a self. Atman. Yeah. yeah. Atman is a self, and it. it I'm getting confused with Brahman and Atman. The Brahman is the ruling class in the caste system. Right, right, right. Uh, so that uh, it's a creation myth, and that the Atman divides, and then it, it it's like, well, it, it, it's, it says, here am I, I'm all alone. It gets scared, but then it says, well, I'm all alone. What should I be afraid of? But then it decides to divide, and it creates it's male and then it's got a female counterpart, but then, then it wants to mate with the female counterpart. But the female's like, well, why would, why do you want to, why would I let you mate with me? So it turns into a deer. And so the, the male turns himself into a deer and he goes and he chases her down. They procreate and that makes all the deer. And then one by one, they start shifting forms and they end up creating all the animals and living organisms. Kind of like the cell does that. Like a cell just divides and divides and creates all the organisms we have around us. So it's programmed in, into the cell. And then we get that idea of, well, if also the self-destruction is encoded into the cell and we, all of us are made up of cells, then it makes kind Speak of sense that we have this self, <laughs> that we have this, you're made up of uh, Vienna sausages, right? <laughs> and gin. <laughs> and gin uh, on a good day. <laughs> and, uh, so it would make sense that we also have you know, and we shouldn't sausages be sausages su- and gin. <laughs> <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> it's like um <clears throat> so it should it shouldn't surprise us that we have this self-destruct code right in us and it's there. And so we incorporate it. We try to figure out how to incorporate it maybe rather than get rid of it. I don't know. Well, but, that's that's also that also sort of uh mirrors the fractal uh fractalinear sort of pattern of the the mandala i mean if the if our cells or if our genes have the self-destruct me- mechanism it makes sense that at a larger scale we also yeah. we also have the tendency and that is i mean that's that is the essence of what a fractal is in shape yeah and, and so that's looking backwards and saying oh well our self-destruct mechanism comes from the the multitude of cells that we're made of okay all of those have it encoded into them too so it makes sense that we have it okay is there a chance that maybe we can project forward okay what do we as humans what bigger organism do we as humans make up that might also have its own self-destruct code in it which could be the life cycle of a corporation or a company or a nation a city state an ideology or artificial intelligence so Oh, so like artificial intelligence having a life cycle and and dying as well. That's well, I mean, if artificial, we were we were talking before about about uh, that possibility, the singularity, artificial intelligence being composed of the uh, the sort of ethos of the internet, which is compo- which okay. uh, which our thoughts make up, right? Yeah. So if it takes on that form, I think mm-hmm. I think I don't know if, remember if it was Facebook or whatever. One of the large companies created one for a short time. It wasn't a general artificial intelligence. It was just sort of us. Uh, it was a it was an algorithm of some sort, and it started 
it started uh, slinging fascistic epitaphs uh, uh, <laughs> very, very early on. It was it's, <laughs> it was saying Nazi yeah. things, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> The, the very early on emphasis was <laughs> that's that's something to think about oh that's what we're gonna do that's what we're made of or something well i mean that's what it did <laughs> i mean yeah. it's really just yeah cats and nazis um uh <laughs> that's, what, that's what ai is gonna be <laughs> ai is gonna be cats and nazis much like i'm vienna sausages and gin <laughs> <laughs> I want to hang out with the Vienna sausage and gin AI. It sounds, it sounds like it tastes uh, better. Yeah. What are you saying? Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different movie conversation. <clears throat> uh, garoomph. Um, uh, there, so I actually have a list of symbols, and we went through most of them. Uh, okay. Meteor. Yeah. Lighthouse. Uh, I'll just I'll just list them. Lighthouse. Meteor, oh. Mandala, Ouroboros, Prism, Bear. Uh, so the bear, yeah, yeah. yeah. We got Lighthouse. I think we talked about Lighthouse sufficiently and Meteor, uh, Meteor pretty well. Uh, I wanted to mention one Can thing I... about the the very quickly about the uh, Mandala because we were talking about creation. Why is it that she's looking at this fractal pattern that's sort of constantly changing? Um, uh, have you ever seen Samsara? That I seen haven't. Some? Yeah, check it out. Maybe we should discuss it sometime. It's it's very interesting. Well, you've got it on the list. I do. Uh, there's one scene where the Tibetan monks are creating a mandalic structure because mandalas are a big part of Buddhism, especially Tibetan Buddhism. And they're they, what they do is they tap little funnels of sand mm -hmm. in together, and they create this gigantic mandala structure and the moment that it's finished they destroy it they wipe it away and they start fresh and this is symbolic of i mean this is essentially representative of creation so i thought i mean the reason i think the when i saw that when she's looking into the mandala structure and it's sort of pulsating mm -hmm. in front of her i thought you know then this is this is telling me that there's a moment of creation happening um that, that i think that's what it's about yeah so with yeah with the that was about the, with the oh with mandalas so when you look at temple structures you have the there's kind of five points in a pyramid or in these circular temples you have the north south east and west the cardinal points they all have gates where people come in and out of the compound of the mandala and then at the top of the in the middle and usually elevated with uh, in the temple compound is that structure where the priests go to meet with the gods or receive communication from heaven. So kind of in the movie, we've got five characters. We've got four kind of cardinal points that are kind of sloughed off. And then we've got the fifth character, which is Lena, and she's the point of consciousness that sort of floats above the... When you have four... You have, when you have that... Four, the number four is a quaternity and it generally symbolizes wholeness or completeness. And so we've got, or in China death. Th is that what four is in China? Yeah. <laughs> well, Hey, it works. It works for the movie. It's too equivalent because... to the number 13 in, in the West because ah, si it means that. four and si also means death. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so if we're looking at her four companions in the movie as, parts of herself well we're then we're told that okay we have lena and then we have a complete representation of herself in the film which is the four other characters that she has to kill off mm. to become a new person i don't know it's kind of might be reaching fun connections to draw yeah it's fun yeah, it's fun maybe. yeah I, I think it's reaching just because of the reason that they overlap in in chinese because they mm. are totally yeah. different characters that happen to be I think for unrelated reasons, because there are only so many phonemes in the Chinese language pronounced the same way with a different intonation. One is s and one is s. So they have different pronunciation. Okay. Yeah. Well, in in the movie, the four being the idea of completeness, and we've got to completely get rid of 
and regardless of the the Chinese connection, it's a complete right. eradication of her former self. Yeah, I'll remember that. Next time. you will. <laughs> Next I'm sure time I see it for. Uh, what about what about the meteor? Oh, you want to mention the meteor? I think we. Okay, yeah, the go meteor. ahead. I, yeah, we talked about it a well, bit, but only because in other movies and uh, Eliotti talks I'm gonna, about it. Hold on, let and... me let me actually. I'm gonna. I'm okay. literally gonna text you these, or I'm gonna send them to you um, right now, just so you have them in front of your face. Um, just so that it's not just me who's saying them. Can you see those? Pull up your, uh, kind of yeah, let me let me get to that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I got you. Well, you remember all. Of them. Um, yeah. Well, so the meteor. Eliade talks about anytime you have a meteor and not anytime, but again, a lot of times in mythology, when you have a meteor, that's an indication of some communication from God, some divine uh, insertion into our reality, a new thing coming into the mundane state. And what do we have in the movie? We've got this thing from outer space coming down. It's a meteorite, yeah. looks like one, and it's going to create new things. So it's kind of this holy it's regarded well in the past it's regarded as this holy communication or holy gift or holy artifact kind of like the the kaaba uh, in mecca mm -hmm. you know the, the if there's a meteorite inside of it right yeah and so. right, that, yeah meteor meteorites throughout um throughout stories in mythology and yeah uh in our previous discussion of arrival it's the right. the ships that come from the sky who bring the new consciousness of being able to being able to uh, think forward and backward in time as opposed to linearly, right? And and how many how many ships were there in that movie? Uh oh yeah, it was twelve, wasn't it? It's twelve. Solar journey, consciousness, wow, enlightenment, wow. Uh, twelve apostles. Exactly. Yeah. Uh. So anyway, that was the meteor thing I wanted to insert because if, if people are watching all these things, they're like, oh, okay, reinforcing the idea. Now it's their own, so they'll see it. Yeah. Can you imagine oh. somebody watching this? <laughs> uh, bear. I, actually, I didn't, about... have, I didn't have a bear. I, I, I didn't even think about the bear thing. Uh, I think okay. you had that in your notes, so you want to mention that. I, I noticed that in the notes that you yeah. sent and the sort of the question I, questions I already had down – really seemed to uh coincide well which was which was validating made me feel <laughs> like i've got a brain too and uh yeah. made me feel made me feel good about myself but i didn't write anything down about the bear yeah okay that's gonna be a good that, that's a fun one that's so all right that's really fun because i think it took the second or third viewing i've seen it four times now i've watched it three times in the past week and then once a long time ago so i watched it today for the first time did you really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, so what it takes me four times to see, you get 85, 95% of it in one time. No, no, so no. There's, you, I mean, your, your, notes, you your notes are extensive, extensive. I just mean okay. some of the things that I had written down, I didn't have to add extra because I thought, because I had a question related to that. So I thought, okay, ooh. It made yeah, me feel so, good about myself. That's what I'm gotcha. saying. Yeah. I mean, for a guy with made of Vienna sausages and gin, um, I felt good. As you're always the to the to the extent that I can, because uh, it's limiting when you're made of basic proteins and alcohol. But you're always the first invited to the party. Well, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, yeah. people like to snack on me as I pass by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about the movie and then relate it to the book. So the bear in the movie. Uh, the bear kills two out of four, uh, well, two out of five of the people in the movie. It kills Shepard and not Raddick, but Anya. I can't remember Anya's last name, but their names have meanings too. I, I'd I'm be sure cool they to do. mention that. Yeah. So, uh, two out of five. Out yeah, of it's only the the psychologist and and uh, Lena who make it. Yeah, correct. To the lighthouse, correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a scene where they, they get out of the swamp or out of the base camp where they find the video of Lena's husband 
slicing open that guy. So they leave there and they're walking to this village or this town and there's all these floral formations growing in the shape of humans and all of the houses have been overgrown with kudzu and ivy and whatnot. And Kud- did you notice kudzu? that? Kudzu? Do you know kudzu? No, what's kudzu? I don't know what that is. What's oh, kudzu? Man. It's a, so it's all over the South. Like where I grew up, it was everywhere. And it's an invasive kind of ivy, I guess, kind of looking plant that just covers everything. It, everything you see that's on those houses, that's kudzu. Kudzu. And it just overgrow. Yeah. Is overgrows that a colloquial, is that, that a colloquialism or is that, is that, that's what it's, that's what the plant is called. I don't know. It's like saying uh, it's covered in moss. It's covered in kudzu. Can you say that if you were to make a sentence of it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Never heard of it and before. So, it's my first time. Yeah, it'll grow up. It'll grow up the total length of a tree and kill it. It'll just grow over everything and kill it. And sounds great. I mean, you have to have Agent Orange to get rid of it, I, if, even if that works. But it's all over the South. Yeah. So they go to that village. It's covered in kudzu. And did you notice that the house they go into to bunk in for the night, it looks just like Lena's house. Did you notice that? Mm-mm. Yeah. If, I should rewatch it. Late. I'll rewatch it. Yeah, that's interesting. It's yeah, gotta... it's the same structure, same layout, uh, and she seems to notice it when she walks in. She walks into the steps and she looks at the photograph on the wall and she's kind of, "What? This is very familiar." And then later that night, the bear attacks. So, what's the significance of the bear? Yeah, uh, if you just, notice, because I didn't mention. Let me just introduce the bear. The bear is this strange, weird bear type creature which attacks one of the characters earlier, and then when it attacks again, it's got screams coming out of its mouth instead of growls. Yeah. 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 It's got it's got Shepard's voice because it killed Shepard. Yeah. And it's screaming, help me, and that kind of thing. And so did you notice the tattoo that Oscar Isaac's character has? He's got it on his, yeah, yeah. On his left breast. Yeah, he's, breast. Got, he's got a bear tattoo, yeah. Yeah, so he's got a bear tattoo, and and if we're thinking of the shimmer as a place where your inner fears or struggles are projected outwards, then I'm thinking that the bear is actually a representation of Lena dealing with uh, Kane's anger at her, mm. because it's this monster that's kind of haunting them and stalking them the entire time, and in the book, the same thing happens and it's not a bear and i don't i don't remember it you never see it but what happens in the book is that they hear the, all four of them hear something screaming in the night and at one point they howl back at it just to kind of make light of the situation and, and deal with being this freaky place and right. so and then and there's one scene where lena kind of confronts it and she runs away from it but she never sees it but it's, it's interesting because when she gets away from it, it kind of pulls back from the pursuit of Lena and it howls out of grief. It sounds like it's grieving, mm. kind of like her husband is grieving in the same way. So, which like that he, yeah, that's very interesting. So, and, and his, but his, um, his grief is what creates the husk of the person that returns. Because mm. he is unable to, it kind of brings me back to the the point I was trying to make about the affair being maybe something that happens to be the right thing for her that she shouldn't feel. <coughs> Excuse me, regret about. Um, it shouldn't, in the context of being who she is, right? In the context of centering the self this happens to be maybe the right thing for who you are that the the guilt that has destabilized you needs to brought be brought back to center but that doesn't happen to work with the person you are living with the person who's your husband who you also love and it it is actually destroying them it's it's Mm. it's destroying this person to the extent that they're no longer the person who they once were, who you remember when you think back on them. They're a different person now. And and that's going to, you know, result in uh, either that person, with, you know, withdrawing further or maybe a, a, a 
divorce or a further conflict. I mean, I guess that's not really suggested at, but when they hug at the end of the film, there's sort of this suggestion that um, not a compromise has been reached, but but they're both in a place where they're at least able to move forward and the uh, dynamics of the relationship are changed. To the, to the point of it's a recurrent theme, like in that movie Transcendence. Have you seen that? I haven't. With Johnny Depp. <laughs> Interesting ideas. It's, it can be kind of cheesy, but eh, it wasn't bad. Um, but in, in a lot of movies, you've got kind of a, a couple or a pair, a married couple, boyfriend and girlfriend, lovers, partners, whatever. That, but they get separated, and, the, and then the entire movie is about them coming back together, which is kind of like the Isis and Osiris myth. Because mm-hmm. she loses her husband and then she goes on this journey to put him back together and resurrect him, kind of like Lena is doing in this movie. That's an so, interesting way of looking at it, too. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of movies do it. And again, it's one of those stories that just seems to persist because it does something for us. It resonates or whatever. But um, were there were there any other elements of hinduism or buddhism that you thought were sort of present in either some of the symbolism or some of the elements of the story that we didn't we didn't talk about oh uh just the idea of maya maybe illusion okay so um you know when they're in the shimmer well kind of like the bear you know that that is potentially a projection of lena's inner conflict or a manifest, a physical manifestation of sort of a, a thing she's fighting, or some monster that she's having to face, and yeah, and that it's an, <clears throat> and then uh, yeah, is it, the the idea that it, the shimmer is what it is. It's a shimmer, so it's an obscuring of reality. Um, yeah, I was Can just you, trying to think if. What do you mean ahead. by Maya, though? Yeah, so the idea of Maya in Hinduism is a Maya is a goddess, and what she does is she does she has three functions. She uh, projects an illusion, she obscures the truth, and then she also reveals the truth. So kind of like the the phone conversation we've had in the past, where uh, or the something that's so that is incredibly novel is akin to magic. That's a thing that you've mentioned before so like looking at a, a phone it's like oh my god it's this magical wonderful thing there's the illusion that it's kind of like magic and then it obscures the truth that what it really is is a bunch of component parts built in a factory working off of physics that makes a thing happen mm-hmm. so it's mundane in that sense that it's not magic but then once you know that that's what it is that it's a bunch of physical parts that work off of physics then that reveals the truth because right. you, you know that now so yeah in, in the sense the the shimmer is the same way from the outside it is uh obscuring the truth and then from the inside it is projecting something else because the, the, all of these phenomenons are manifestations of the inner psyche so there's this projection of things but then once you go to the heart of it and you deal with it it reveals what you're actually dealing with does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, that's yeah. And the environment in the environment too, right? The actual I mean, if if this film happened in a desert, it would be a different story than than yeah. this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh did you draw any parallels with that and the way that uh True Detective was done? I mean, the fact that True Detective was if if people watching this if you haven't seen our previous discussion about the True Detective. We did an eight-part series about it. Check it out. Uh, one of the things we mentioned was the fact that it's in the swamp land and surrounded by water that's sort of encroaching. That that has yeah. a sort of um, not, a, not 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 the impression of danger, but the impression of uh, at any moment this could swallow me up in a sense, right? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about about that a little bit at the beginning of the conversation already yeah yeah I, I the same thing i'd say just uh it, it, it the whole movie feels kind of wet and moist and fertile like fertile grass fertile ground fertile fields that are gonna 
from which new life is going to spring up or new forms are going to come out of the swamp, you know, a new cell, a new type of creature, a species, whatever. Until they get to the beach. Yeah. At which point it, it, it's the crystalline structure, which I guess is sort of uh, huh, drawing okay. from the ocean. I don't. I didn't know what to make of that, but... Um, yeah, the... I mean salt. Salt is a crystal, and it's by the sea. So I sort of thought it was it was a salt, some sort of salt structure. Yeah, there's an idea of the only things that came to mind with the trees was the idea of the lightning body or the di- the diamond body, which is I forgot exactly what it is in I think Eastern mythology, but there's another thing in I think the shamanic traditions in Australia or Australasia, if you were going to become a shaman, what they think, what there was a ceremony in some places where you, your innards would be taken out, kind of your, your fleshy innards would be taken out and replaced with diamonds and ju- not jewels, but, uh, yeah, crystals and things like that because they're hard. And so they're revered. So I didn't know if maybe that was the connection they were going for. Okay. It's kind of hard to parse that one, but that well, was all I got. One Did of the things you that's get something uh, else. No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I, I I have no idea. And the other thing I have no idea about, just absolutely no clue, is the the part where they're looking at the video of uh, Poe Dameron uh, <laughs> slicing the guy open, the making the square of his abdomen. And pulling it yeah. open and then seeing the intestines sort of uh, writhing and moving inside of his body. That uh, I didn't – I mean, obviously, she's looking at his journey, I guess, uh, but I don't know what to make of it. I really don't. Yeah, that's – yeah. I was thinking with that, it, it ties into uh, Anya. So Anya, when they go into – Lena's house and she looks down at her hands and her her fingerprints and her palm prints are, are swirling and kind of moving around. Yeah. That's like an idea of a loss of identity. Like who am I? What am I? And so Poe, Oscar Isaac, when he's slicing that guy open, if the rest of his teammates are parts of himself, you know, maybe that's the case too, then it tells us that they're going through the same thing of a question of identity because I think one of the ideas in psychology and mythology is that when you're thinking about your intestines, it's kind of akin to the curves and the ins and outs and the confusion of a maze. Mm. And so, and the maze is, is a, a mechanism by which you get, you have to, in a maze, you have to get to the center. Right. And it's connected to the intestines. And so it seems like what he's talking about, and he says that thing later about um, my skin is liquid my mind is detached so that whole yeah the skin is liquid thing does sort of call to mind the fingerprints comment um from yeah. the other from the other girl that makes sense I, I i was trying i was thinking about that today and i just couldn't i couldn't come up with anything it seemed like mm-hmm. everything i came up with was kind of a reach you know um why why are they doing surgery on that guy why is it someone <laughs> else on his team that you know they're doing that too and then why is he after that washing his hands in the water with the blood uh then why why did why is yeah. there the scene where where then the the um parasites have basically grown out of his body and exploded his body i mean obviously that's meant to create a sense of danger for the team that we're following now but it's kind if, of beautiful too isn't it it is yeah i mean if you but if you're trying to it's map macabre. it on to yeah, yeah. Well, certainly it is. I mean, the whole fungal thing, the whole fungal theme of the the or the lichens growing up the trees, all of that is is extremely beautiful. And the the people shaped um, uh, trees mm-hmm. or plants that that are have grown in the shape of trees because of refraction. Um, it, um, yeah, it, it, it it's beautiful. But I just trying to map it onto his journey, even though we see very little of it, was kind of hard to do. Um, it's easier yeah. to do for her because it's a little bit more overt, except for the very end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for him, it's I, I, I wasn't quite sure. And so you sort of have to just look at that video at the very end when he 
says, I don't know who I am. I thought I was this person. That sort of suggests, okay, this is, I mean, this is what happens when you essentially dissolve into uh, the uh, the higher realm, whatever that happens to be, uh, you know, when you're yeah. maybe not fully enlightened, but at least you, you've reached a point where you're either a, a, a night of infinite resignation or you're, you, you no longer feel any attachment to the world as it is, right? Yeah. Whatever, whatever his, his journey has been. But uh, yeah, I found that part very, very confusing, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to watch it again. Is it, does that happen in the book? No, it doesn't happen in the book. It's is different. It, oh. Is it, does he go before her? Yeah. He's on the previous, he's on the previous expedition on the 11th expedition. And did they find and, video uh, footage. There's no video. So in the book, there's no modern technology at all. They've got note, waterproof notebooks and they've got old guns. <laughs> like I think except for that they, they were given the concession, I think, of one automatic rifle. And they don't say an M16, but I'm guessing something like an M16. But at one point, one of the characters breaks it down to clean it and it's made of 30 year old parts. So it's just Why? everything is I think it's because they don't know what's in the shimmer and they don't want to take technology in there that could be uh, amalgamated and then used against humans. That's kind of the explanation. Uh, that makes sense, I suppose. Yeah. Give yeah. as little ammunition so, to the enemy as possible. Right, right. And the lighthouse, so in the book, there's two uh, There's two locations. The, the village is there. There is the the lighthouse, and then there is a there's base camp, and then there's a a structure. It's like this round structure, and it's got an opening. I think they say it's about six feet in diameter on the ground. It's raised eight inches, and there's a square opening that's got some steps, and they go down into the steps, and they see a bunch of crazy stuff down there. So. Why did I bring that up? I forgot. No, no, no. sort of anticlimactic <laughs> but, in the way that you told it there. Well, so I mean, it's getting you, excited. Want... <laughs> they got a bunch of crazy well, stuff down there. Like, yeah. like what? <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll go into it. The uh, yeah. I, well, the reason I, I mentioned that is because in the movie they combined those two things. So in the movie you've got the the consciousness lighthouse part, and then you've got the womb structure below the lighthouse. But in the book, there's separate places. Oh, uh, I see. Separate location. I see. Yeah, so they combine it for the movie, which makes sense because they don't, you know, that's just more time you have to have to build a location and a set and all this stuff. So that's fine. Uh, but you do have in the book, you've got the crawler or that orb character from the movie is called the crawler in the book. And it's a little bit different, but it's writing on the wall and it's writing these weird sentences in kind of a, a fungal algae. And the characters have these confrontations with the crawler. So that thing is you is throughout the story that, that, um, Micah covered sort of shimmering character that is confronted at the no, end. Not, it's not the same in the, in the book, in the book is it, it's this shape shifting being of light in the movie. It's kind of that orb for Micah, kind of ge ge not ge uh, geological mutating thing. The other symbol that we didn't really talk about was the, I don't know if it's a symbol so much, but uh, maybe uh, an idea that's mentioned by the astrophysicist or the physicist is the prism, uh, refraction mm. as a concept, refraction as a concept, biology being refracted, the radio waves being refracted, right? So um, when that character appears at the end, the Formica character, the crawler, the uh, mirror image of herself. Um, well, the, the crawler and Formica are, are different. Like the, there's a, the, 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 the Formica character comes out of the crawler, I think is what happens in the movie. What's the crawler? So the crawler, so the crawler is the orb down... Oh. In the, in the oh, beneath the lighthouse, yeah. but that okay. creates 
a separate thing, which is that I just, didn't, I just didn't know what I was talking yeah. about. Okay, yeah, I, I just don't know. I just don't. <laughs> I, I was trying to be cool and know and say crawler, no, thinking I knew what I was talking about, but I didn't know that was called the crawler. You're talking about it, the um, first thing is the mandala, pulsating mandala. The second is the uh, person in the green screen suit. Uh, copying her movements, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that's right, right, right. The, I just wanted to make, maintain the distinction. For Micah character. Right. 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 Yeah. Whatever. Um. <laughs> Get over yourself, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I appreciate it. I, I yeah. Um, I should, I should not, I should not say things that I don't, that I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to be cool. Uh, so, yeah, ref, uh, re- the refraction um, concept or the prism concept, w- which is when when white light moves through a prism, it is spread into its constituent wavelengths, um, including, if there are uh, other forms of light, the invisible. Mm. So if you were to refract white light through a prism you would see the colors of the rainbow. But if you were to put a thermometer on each of the colors, you would see a higher temperature according Hmm. to the different colors. And bizarrely, if you were to put a thermometer just beyond purple, in just above it, where it looks like there's nothing, the temperature would be even higher than purple because that's Hmm. the ultraviolet spectrum. So it's there... But our eyes can't can't see it, right? So that's one of the things that I mean. I know it's not really it's not really supposed to be. It's not something that the the the, the writers or or the director was trying to bring out. But that's one of the things that came to mind when first the idea of refraction was mentioned. Then I saw this this character, this um, imitating character, pop out of the crawler, the the uh, mandala as this sort of um, he, the being of this woman has been now refracted into two pieces once she has confronted the ultimate depths of herself the monster that is herself is in a sense the opposite of herself copies her looks like her but contains some sort of uh, detritus or some sort of the thing that she wants to get away from the thing that needs to be left behind or discarded or maybe uh, maybe um, uh, taken as part of herself to then you know leave and, and and become a more whole person or whatever whatever process that is that that character that copy of herself uh, I I was wondering as it was happening why doesn't it just immediately copy her why doesn't it just immediately look like her because if i think a normal filmmaker would say oh yeah it immediately just becomes an exact copy of her and then it follows her around and does exactly what she does but it only happens later it resolves into her but at first it just copies her movements and the thing that's sort of beyond her is the the temperature gradient just above purple in the the prism that is the part of yourself that is far deeper than your conscious mind is, which somehow knows you better, hmm. which <clears throat> is capable of defeating you unless you understand it. Unless you know that you can, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but unless you know that you can put the thermometer just above purple and say, oh, wow, that there's actually something there. There's a higher temperature yeah. there, right? That is the ability to realize that the thing that's deep down that is created by trying to sort of plumb the depths of myself and my shadow i have to first acknowledge that it's more powerful mm-hmm. than me that it's that when i punch it and then it punches me back because it's copying me that it's punch is harder than my punch i have to first admit to myself that that's true and that's very mm-hmm. hard to do and the i think the jungian conception would be again the hardest part is to ad- acknowledge that the thing that is more primordial, the thing that is buried deep down, is capable of clobbering you and destroying you. And the thing that is hardest to do is to say, yeah, that's true. 
then you're able to you're able to either make it part of yourself or 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 defeat it and bring bring out the elements of that thing that maybe give it power or whatever it is but when i saw that sort of those elements came together and i know that's not really something that the film is trying to say but that's uh. one one reason why i think it didn't just immediately copy her in appearance right it's this thing that's doing what she's doing but it's a blank slate at the same time or it's a it's a it's um a facsimile that's not quite perfect at the same time because it's somehow beyond her understanding and only when she understands it can she put the grenade in its hand and create the you know create the the fire that burns the whole thing down yeah and do you think that so did that make any sense i don't, I, I <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think you're right. I think that's exactly what the film is trying to say. It's talking about the shadow. I mean, it's a dark, it's a dark being. It's the shadow. It's the, and you were talking about it not being fully formed. It's not fully formed for Lena until she acknowledges it and actually touches it or comes into contact with it. And mm -hmm. then it, then she starts to see it manifest. Oh, this is me. Like the shadow that I, the thing I'm trying to fight is me. And when she realizes that, then she figures out how to trick it, and she destroys it, which Jung wouldn't say destroy the shadow. He would say incorporate it, but I think in the, the film's language is saying that <clears throat> it's, uh, it's more of whereas other people have been destroyed or consumed by the shadow, she has she does, in fact, incorporate it. She takes ownership over the, rather than the shadow getting the best of her. Right. She's not killed by it. She moves on. Right. And she burns down. It's like, why does she burn down the lighthouse? Well, she burns down that, I think, center. It represents a center, the lighthouse, center of consciousness. And so maybe she burns it down because now that old center of consciousness is not useful anymore. So it has to be rebuilt somewhere else. Or it means that now she has a more full consciousness because it's everywhere. There's or, not a singular... Yeah. Or because it's a lighthouse and it was covered in vines and uh, uh, crustacean that now that the, yeah. the crustacean has been burned away, now the lighthouse is able to fulfill its actual function, which is to point the direction or, or be a guidepost in some way and, you know, show you where yeah. you are. Uh, I didn't, I mean, I certainly think the film leaves plenty of room for saying that for, le for the incorporation of the shadow as opposed to the the full defeat of the shadow because there's I mean, there's a difference between destruction and putting mm -hmm. your putting a knife on the shadow's neck and saying you know i i win this this round all right uh because i understand you i think that is more like that because when she's talking to yeah. dr strange's uh um sidekick she has the tattoo on her arm <laughs> She has the glowy yeah. eyeballs when she hugs her um, her husband again, and she she doesn't bleed when she drinks either. Yes, neither do I. I mean, I <laughs> so remember when Kane when Kane's character comes back and finds her painting the bedroom, which I forgot to mention something there, but when he comes back to find her in the bedroom they go downstairs and talk and he takes a sip of water and there's blood in the water well that's because he's yeah, when he puts that's because he's on. dying i don't think it's the water yeah. didn't spark it did it they show the same sequence of shots when lena takes a sip of the water it's ah. saying that she's not ah. she's not she's still herself got it uh, yeah 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 makes sense makes sense and he's now he has been rehabilitated but she, maybe he's protected by her destruction of the the sh of the shadow or her her defeat of the shadow um and not of his own of his own doing or something like that mm -hmm. it's because of what she did that brought things back to center not of not because of what he did that brought things back to center because he came back he came back a wreck and she came back a whole right yeah. he she came back more than she was and he came back less than he was yeah there's <clears throat> Campbell talks about the idea that people that achieve nirvana when they're walking around, they're they're walking around like a burnt string. So if you see it, then he says, if you see a burnt string on the ground, it looks like a string, but the second you blow it, it's just dust and it goes away. Yeah. There's no substance or anything. That's a good image. Sort of holding it together. 
Yeah. So, so he's she, and he's he. Yeah. Go ahead. She, I mean, she she's got to hold them together now <laughs> because she's the one with the strength, maybe. Yeah. 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 So I, when I saw it the first time, that's what I was thinking that oh, it's that whole <clears throat> being blown out literally and the burnt string idea you know there's yeah i see this person that looks like the flesh and the human i, I recognize visually but the the human isn't there anymore like right. the ego is gone so right. they're blown out yeah yeah um i think you were going to mention something about the painting the room yeah so the music they're playing <clears throat> i'm pretty sure that it's a song by a band called america but the the lyrics go so he she's painting the room upstairs and then we see downstairs and, and Kane walks into the frame and right before he's going to go up the stairs, the lyrics to the song go, they are one, they are one person. They are two people. They are three together. No, no, no. They are one person. They are two alone. They are three people. They are for each other. So that was just an interesting choice of music. What do you make? And then trying to, uh, marriage of opposites and completeness and wholeness and that kind of, that kind of thing. Painting, painting the room is, is, I mean, a clear, uh, that, that, that's very intentional. The fact that she's painting the room to try to put a thin layer. It's, it's, Mm. it's again, goes back to the idea of, the hopeless endeavor of trying to put a thin layer over a far deeper problem. I mean, the, the, the conflict, the turmoil is bubbling within and you're trying to cover it over with a couple of shots, of Jack Daniels. I mean, <laughs> nice try, but it's not going to work. That's, that's essentially what she's doing there. She, that's why she's painting the room. She's, she doesn't know. It's sort of like, um, you know, someone who's, someone who's, suffering the loss of a loved one and they still haven't come to grips with the fact that that loved one is gone and they've said they've accepted it but in fact what they're what they're doing is by saying they're accepting it um and in words telling themselves something that they that they are also telling themselves is not a lie which is a lie which is suppressing the the deeper uh, the deeper problem that then pops out elsewhere and creates complexes and issues and problems all over the place. I've seen that yeah. in people I know, and it's sad mm-hmm. to see. Um, it's unfortunate. <laughs> it's very sad and tragic, <laughs> and also yeah. a real a real drag. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a a low down bummer. Yeah, that's why I'm laughing so hard. Um, Right. <laughs> as one should do. As one should do. Uh, I was uh, laugh about your dead friends. Why not? Um, uh, that's dark. <laughs> that's dark for being a sausage and gin. Um, well, let's not invite him back to the party. <laughs> is there anything else? Is there anything that we didn't cover from your notes, your ideas? I mean, we could just go through the list. We can just yeah. list it. <laughs> Um, we're the only ones watching at this point. And so we might as well just go through the list. I, I've got everything from my notes. That's it. We've talked about all of the symbols. Yeah. We've talked about get the, the, uh, the Aeroboros and the, um, um, the guilt complex, uh, the, uh, all women team. I, I've everything from my list is, is covered. Yeah, no, I think, I think we did it. I think it was, a uh, other than just talking about their names, uh, I mean, I could mention that real quick. Sure. Like, uh, so I just, any, like with the, the names just seemed like they had to be significant. And we know that the psychologist, her name is Ventress, which means belly, stomach, or womb. And she's kind of this, she gives birth to the teams because she picks and chooses them. And she's mm-hmm. also, she also gives birth to that, the mandala or the crawler in the movie. Uh, let's see, Shepard, I guess that kind of makes sense. Uh, Josie Raddick, Raddick, I, I, that's a Slavic word, which means glad or merry. And she's the, the girl who cuts herself. So it's kind of the opposite of her demeanor. That's kind of just an interesting thing to think about. Anya, I can't remember her last name, but 
Um, and Lena, I don't know, I thought Magdalena would be the closest. But that's as far as I got. I just thought those were cool things to bear in mind as you're thinking about the characters and how they act and what they're going through. So Borderline cool. What is... <laughs> <laughs> the tepid cool. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what is Matt... What does Matthew mean? Gift of God. Gift of God. I was, I, I was given the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to file, about a, Luke? file a complaint. A um, it means enlightened one. So very apt, very appropriate, pretty much spot on as, as far as names go. 